So welcome everyone. My name is Alex Hughes. I'm the secretary of the Lafayette Alliance, and we're very, very happy to have you uh, with us this evening um, for the 2022 speaker series. I have a few announcements to begin here, and then we'll introduce our speaker and let her take uh, the next half hour or so uh, to delight us with her knowledge. Um, a picture, if you haven't been to Lafayette Square in LaGrange, Georgia, not the one in DC, uh, or in or in Louisiana, um, then I would definitely highly recommend it. We uh, the city of Lagrange just put in new LED lights, and recently uh, they have been blue and gold uh, for it showing solidarity with Ukraine. Um, although the picture here doesn't show that, so but there you are. And a few announcements. Uh, Dr. Ingram has begun a little bit of a podcast. Um, you can find that at LafayetteLagrange.org/slash Living Lafayette. Kind of starting up um, there and, and getting some interest and trying to get, on, get to get it onto different platforms and such. And I uh, kind of put his main quote for the podcast there: "Why the Marquis de Lafayette speaks to you today? Why Lafayette should be streaming on every IMAX theater in America? Lafayette can unite a community, your community. Lafayette's four philosophies for living life well." And then today we had uh, Dr. Ingram and I went to the uh, to the square. We had our student art competition winners, and you can see some of their works there, uh, as well as them with us and their teachers at the fountain. If you want more on that, of course, visit, visit us at LafayetteLagrange.org. And those of you who are members that are with us tonight, please be on the lookout in the next week or so. You will be receiving the newest edition, the spring edition of the Cockade. Uh, the newsletter for the Lafayette Alliance, and you can see kind of the uh, the look for it this go round. Also, uh, you can view our past cockade newsletters online there at lafayettelagrange.org slash cockade newsletter, but this edition won't be online until about a week or two after the members receive it in their mailboxes. And just a heads up, we're a few months away um, from September 6, 2022. We will again be in person for the celebration of Lafayette Day in Georgia. And uh, it will be at 10 a.m. on September 6th at Lafayette Square on LaGrange, uh, in LaGrange, Georgia. And for more information on the lineup and all that, follow us on social media, of course. But you can also go to lafayettelagrange.org slash Lafayette Day 2022. And of course, all of our social media accounts follow us and, and uh, you'll hear all the stuff that we have going on. We stay very, very busy. And our online store. I was hoping that by tonight, I would be able to say that we have the cabinet in stock. Uh, we have contacted Harvard Press and we are, uh, we do have Dr. Travinsky's book on the way and it will soon be there within the next few days, I hope. So you can purchase uh, her book from us uh, at lafayettelagrange.org slash shop or any of your local bookstores like pretty good books here in LaGrange um, or that place that rhymes with a zon. You can get it there as well. All right. Um, and then if you'd like to support the Lafayette Alliance and join our membership, you can do so as well at our website. So with that, I have the, the oh, there we go. I had the great pleasure tonight to introduce to you uh, Dr. Lindsay M. Travinsky. I will say that my um, following uh, of uh, Dr. Travinsky, she is kind of a, one of those historians you follow, um, not in the, in the creepy way, of course, but uh, started before the pandemic. Uh, she was actually, I follow quite a bit of the White House Historical Association's things, and she was working for them at the time and has since uh, moved on. But um, then right before the pandemic, or as the pandemic was starting, she released her book, and uh, couldn't have the book launch that she wanted. And I remember getting my uh, copy of the cabinet. And then I saw that she was offering uh, personalized signed book plates, which I think she still has going on. And so I sent it in and I said, you know, I, I, I think I had to send a picture of my book. And so I put it on my bookcase and I sent it in and I got my book plate. Uh, but I read the book then. And uh, at that point, we, had, uh, we were just thinking of the idea of the speaker series. And our first season, and I said, Dr. Ingram, we've got to get this Dr. Travinsky here. And I really think this relates, and I love her book. And uh, I think now she's working on a new book. And um, we're just very, very excited to have her. She is, um, I guess, uh, 
presidential historian is how you would define yourself. And um, so we, we're very excited to have her this evening. And uh, without further ado, I will be quiet because you didn't come for me. Uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Travinsky. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's a delight to speak with you all. One of the things that's so exciting about speaking with a group like this one is I know that if I make Hamilton musical jokes, it will be understood. And that's particularly important because in the age of Zoom, you can't always tell, you know, how your jokes go over. And at one point I was talking to a group and I mentioned something about Lafayette and I said, you know, everyone's favorite fighting French man. And I said it just like that. And uh, the group was silent. And it turned out that there was no one in the group that had seen the musical or understood what I was saying. And so that um, really crashed and burned pretty spectacularly. But um, I am very confident that if I had did that today, you would all know what I'm talking about. So it is a delight to speak with you all. Uh, my plan is to talk a little bit about Washington's Revolutionary War experience, how that shaped his time in office once he was president of the United States. And then I want to leave uh, time for questions at the end. That is always my most favorite part because I want to know what you want to know. And I want to know what you want to learn more about and be able to provide that information. So feel free to put questions in the chat. If they come up while I'm speaking. I promise they won't uh, distract me or interrupt me in any way. Or you can save them for the end if you prefer. So one of the most important aspects of Washington's time um, as commander in chief was his decision to regularly convene councils of war before any major strategic decision. He convened councils before deciding to enter into battle, before deciding to um, commit to a certain location for winter quarters, before ordering a retreat, any any choice that might be deemed controversial or might have significant strategic importance. And initially he did so partly because that was what he was used to from his time in the British forces, but also because Congress had told him it was a good idea. But he quickly realized that having these councils was, was actually incredibly beneficial. And it was incredibly beneficial for three reasons. First, it of course allowed him to get advice and input from people who maybe had seen things he hadn't, had different information or experiences and could provide a different point of view or perspective. It allowed him to build consensus among his officers. They tended to be a fairly riotous bunch and didn't always necessarily agree with one another. And so any opportunity to build consensus was really important. And finally, it provided him with political cover. A lot of the choices that he had to make were particularly unpopular, especially if he was retreating from an important place like New York City. And so those councils of war provided really essential strategic cover if he needed to make that public or if he needed to explain why he had decided to do something. When Washington gathered his councils of war, he typically did so wherever his headquarters happened to be. Now, sometimes it was an incredibly grand and luxurious home like the Longfellow House in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which were the, was the location of his first headquarters. Sometimes it was much more modest homes. This is Washington's headquarters in uh, Westchester, New York, and then the Morris Jumel Mansion in New York City. And sometimes it was his campaign tent. Uh, I don't know if anyone has been to the American Museum or the American Revolution Museum in Philadelphia, but it is a fantastic place. I highly recommend it if you have the opportunity to go. They still have his tent in their collection. It's quite extraordinary. If you go, I recommend taking a look at the entryway. You can actually see where they had to add additional fabric because the standard height for the entrance was too low for Washington. And so they had to actually raise it up because he was so much taller than the average man at the time. So this was a fairly luxurious tent as campaign tents go at the time. It was pretty spacious. It had multiple different chambers within it, but it was still a tent which meant that there were bugs coming in and out. There was no floor. It was probably pretty smelly because horses and um, latrines were not far away. Uh, it was very close quarters and cramped. And so it really reflected the atmosphere of battle and the battlefield and what Washington and his officers were going through. Now, when Washington brought together his officers, uh, he had to come up with a series of strategies to manage these personalities. As I said, they were 
uh, not particularly small personalities. They were not wallflowers. They had very big egos. They were very touchy about their own sense of honor and their identity. They thought that they were right most of the time. They were used to being listened to. And so this was a pretty combustible mix. So Washington came up with a couple of strategies that were really important to managing this atmosphere. First, he really treated his officers and his aides as his official family. He actually used that language, which meant that they regularly dined together. They, when they had downtime, they would go and inspect local sites, whether they be natural beauties or ruins from other things. During the holiday season, when they were in their winter encampments, they would have balls. Many of the wives would come. So there was a real atmosphere of um, familiness, of uh, brotherhood, and Washington was very attentive to the esprit de corps and making sure that that stayed strong so that it could maybe smooth over some of the ruffled feathers in, at more tense times. Before convening a council of war, he would send out a list of questions ahead of time, and that list of questions would serve as the meeting agenda. And this was really important because one, it allowed the officers and the aides to sort of put down their thoughts, get, get their ideas in order, be prepared to give him the advice and support he needed. But he could also then use it as the agenda and try and keep them on track and not veer off into any different directions. Once he was in the meeting, if the officers and the aides disagreed, which happened pretty frequently, he would ask for written opinions. And this was important for a couple of reasons. First, the written opinions allowed Washington to consider the information carefully and slowly. Washington tended to make decisions slowly, and then once he had decided on the right course of action, he would implement it with firmness. But he liked to really study all of his options. He wanted to make sure he had all of the information, he understood what everyone was saying, so having it in writing helped ensure that there was clarity in that way. It provided him with that political cover that he needed in case something went wrong or you know, he needed to have transparency about his officers had supported a particular choice. But it also allowed him to make sure that he heard from everyone. Sometimes the meetings could get loud and um, rambunctious. One of the, my favorite stories is of one of the officers, Charles Lee. He had a pack of hounds that he particularly enjoyed and he didn't really like human company, but he really liked his dogs. And the dogs went with him everywhere and they were notorious for Bane. And I will tell you, I have one hound and that one hound is incredibly loud and disruptive. And I cannot imagine what it would be like to have a pack of hounds. So some of the officers were maybe a little bit on the, the shyer side or the quieter side and didn't always want to go toe to toe with the hounds. Like Nathaniel Green is a good example. So asking for their written opinions made sure that Washington heard from everyone, but also made sure that they felt that their input was really important. They felt that they were needed and wanted, and that was really quite essential. Now, at these various councils of war, one of the figures that was uh, one of Washington's favorites, of course, was the Marquis de Lafayette. And when I talk about the concept of the official family and the brotherhood, it really helps to explain a little bit of Washington and Lafayette's relationship. To be sure, Lafayette was closer to Washington than almost anyone. I think he had a disarming quality, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, that sort of cut through some of Washington's defenses and his natural aloofness. The fact that Washington didn't have any sons and Lafayette was really eager to have a father figure, as well as genuinely eager to contribute and learn went a long way in Washington's book. But that close culture, the closeness physically, but also in terms of the emotional bonds of the military soldiers really do help explain their love and affection for one another, which I think was real and true and an important part of the military experience. So a couple of examples of how this dynamic worked in, in real time. In the summer of 1776, the Continental Army in Washington had a spectacularly bad year. Uh, they were divided up in their forces. The British Navy came into the harbor. Uh, Washington's forces suffered defeat after defeat after defeat. They had to retreat across Long Island, all the way up Manhattan Island, eventually into New Jersey, and then finally straggled into Pennsylvania before going into winter quarters. And these retreats were incredibly embarrassing. They were 
very damaging to the psyche of the nation. They were very damaging to the support for the cause for independence. New York City was at this time the second largest city and was a really critical deep water port. So the loss of this city was a huge blow and Washington knew it was going to be so unpopular that his leadership was really going to be questioned. And in order to ensure that he wasn't questioned too much, every time he ordered a retreat, he would the night before would convene a council of war. And the officers were always unanimous in their decision that retreat was essential because there was quite literally no other option. But Washington would make sure that notes were taken from that council and he sent them to Congress without their asking for it because he wanted to make sure they understood that this was a unanimous decision. And so that summer is particularly evocative of Washington's use of the Council of War to provide political cover during difficult moments. Uh, the next winter was one of the most historic in terms of its badness. <laughs> um, the decision to go into Valley Forge for the winter was one that was actually quite carefully decided. The location of winter quarters was a very important military choice because you had to balance two different factors. You had to be close enough to the British forces that you could keep an eye on them, make sure that they didn't go after Congress, make sure that they didn't uh, put forth too many incursions into the countryside to get too many to supplies or to terrorize the American people. But you also had to be far enough away so that they couldn't surprise attack the American forces so that the American forces had their own sort of base to, with which to gather supplies and to be sure that they would be secure. So trying to find that balance was really essential. And Washington convened several councils of war in October leading up to the decision to go into Valley Forge. And we happen to know that that winter was a particularly bad one, but it wasn't actually because of the location of Valley Forge. It turns out that the supporting community was reluctant to provide supplies and the weather was particularly bad. So that was what made that choice a particularly difficult one. And finally, of course, Washington used councils of war to obtain advice and support. And no better moment in the war demonstrates the value of councils than the council of war he convened on January 2nd in between the battles of Trenton and Princeton. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of Washington crossing the Delaware, on Christmas night, 1776, the surprise victory at Trenton the next morning, the fact that they were able to cross the river without losing a single cannon or a single life was truly a feat with a little bit of luck involved. And it was a huge and essential emotional victory right at the moment when it seemed like the army was gonna completely fall apart and the cause for independence was going to be lost. The part of the story that most people don't know is what actually came after. Cornwallis marched down from Princeton much more rapidly than anyone anticipated and with reinforcements. And those reinforcements sort of pinned Washington against the Delaware at his back, the Assapink Creek right in front of him, and just on the other side of the creek were the British forces. So Washington found himself in a bit of a, uh, a tough spot between a rock and a hard place. He certainly didn't want to risk crossing the Delaware again at night, this time without the element of surprise. He had a, a sense that the British sharpshooters would be waiting and would happily pick off any officers that they could find. So that didn't seem like a particularly good choice. But he also didn't want to engage in a frontal attack because that could potentially risk death or capture, which would mean, again, the cause, of the, the cause for independence would end. So on the night of January 2nd, he convened a council of war. The only real location where they could meet was this little yellow house, which happened to be the headquarters of one of his generals, General Arthur St. Clair. The house was so small, the only the room in the front of the house was the biggest one and they had to remove all of the furniture so that they could all fit in the room, standing room only to, to discuss what to do. And that particular um, night, Washington had also invited some of the local farmers to provide any sort of consultation on the land, on the terrain, to provide any insight that they might have. During the discussions, Arthur St. Clair suggested that some of his men were, who were positioned on the far right flank of the American line had noticed that there was a little trail 
um, that seemed to go past the British line, but weren't, wasn't on any of the maps. And Washington turned to the farmers and asked if they could confirm. And one of the farmers happened to own that land and said, indeed, this trail does exist. It's on my farmland. It goes all the way up to Princeton. I would be happy to take you there and to guide you along the way. Had Washington not been willing to ask for help from his officers, had he not been willing to ask for help from local people, that information would not have been available to him. That course of action would not have been available to him. And we can sort of put that in stark dichotomy to the a council of war that was happening that very night, January 2nd, under Cornwallis's command. Cornwallis tended to run his councils very um, imperially. He would bring his plan and he would expect his officers, many of whom he had sat in uh, parliament with or had gone to boarding school with, and he expected them to just approve the plan rather than to provide other sorts of information. So this experience, because it was so successful and indeed the American forces were able to sneak past the British line, go up and have a victory at Princeton, it confirmed for Washington the value of showing up at a council without his mind made up, of being willing to ask for help, to ask for insight, to ask for advice from those, even if they weren't very well educated, might have different life experiences. And that was really an essential experience and one that he sort of had to humble himself and do again when it came to the siege of Yorktown, which is when, of course, the partnership between the Americans and the French and the very pivotal role that Lafayette played in that decision, or excuse me, in that partnership um, comes to light. The decision to move south to Yorktown was a French choice. Washington preferred to attack New York, but he kind of had to say, okay, because France had the Navy and the United States did not. He allowed the uh, French artillery to actually set up the plan because they had much more experience creating sieges and siege warfare than he did. Um, and he gave them a great deal of credit. And, and that experience would only have come after many years of the war of learning the benefits and value of working with others. So fast forward just a couple of years to the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787. The tallest person or the most featured person in the room is, of course, George Washington, who was the president of the convention. And it's really important to remember that this convention takes place just four years after the end of the war. We tend to kind of separate those two things in our memory, in our history books, um, but they were really quite essential because most of the people at the Constitutional Convention had either fought in the military with Washington, had served in Congress, or had been in some way involved. And they had a very sharp memory of what it had been like to fight a war against the British. So when it came time to craft the executive, they knew that they needed a stronger executive than what they currently had. That was painfully obvious, but they were very reluctant about recreating the same British system. And in particular, they did not want to recreate the British cabinet. Initially, when a conflict between the colonies and the homeland originated, it was actually the cabinet that most Americans blamed for instigating those hostilities. They knew that a cabinet existed. They knew that there were people that had uh, power, had the ear of the king, but it wasn't really clear who made decisions. There was no transparency. There was no reporting or minutes or anything that people could, could latch onto to decide who they should blame for good or bad policies. So when they were at the Constitutional Convention and several of the members put forth different proposals for executive councils, including one that looked almost identical to the president's cabinet that Washington ended up creating, the delegates explicitly rejected these proposals and they voted down uh, a type of system, including a cabinet time and time again. But they were very reasonable men. They understood that no one person could be expected to govern or to lead by themselves. And that of course they needed to provide some form of support for the president. So instead they put two options both of which were in Article 2. The first says that the president, with the advice and consent of the Senate, can make treaties and foreign appointments. Now, the Constitution still says this, and the Senate still has to approve many of the president's appointments and treaties. But in the 21st century, the Senate really acts as either a veto or a rubber stamp for policies or appointments that the president makes independently. 
1787, and indeed 1789, when Washington took office, they fully expected that the Senate would serve as a council of foreign affairs, which makes a little bit more sense when you keep in mind that only 22 senators were seated in the fall of 1789. It was not like he was expected to go get advice from 100 people, because that would be truly ridiculous. But the thought was, because senators were selected by their state legislatures, that the states would select smart, uh, experienced, safe advisors for the president. And if they gave bad advice, then the states could remove those senators and provide better advisors. So this was supposed to be a safe, transparent system. And Washington fully expected to meet with the Senate in this capacity. In August of 1789, he prepared for his first visit. He had sent uh, a bunch of materials ahead of time for the senators to prepare. He gave them homework like any good teacher. He brought a list of questions with him on that day for them to discuss. And he fully expected that they would debate the issues, they would provide input and insight and the same sort of discussion that he had found so valuable for councils of war. Instead, he was met with silence. Some of the senators sort of shuffled papers, twiddled their thumbs, avoided eye contact, anything to avoid being called on, which I will say are still tactics that students use today with very little effect. Well, eventually, one of the senators, Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania, stood up and suggested that they refer the issue to committee because it was new to them and they wanted to debate it and deliberate. And then could Washington come back the following week for their recommendation? Washington absolutely lost it. He stood up and he yelled, this defeats every purpose of my being here, except louder and scarier and much bigger and, and taller. And it's important to remember that this is the most famous man in the world and he was furious with them. So it must have been a very scary moment. He did eventually calm down and he did agree to come back the following week, but the damage was done. And on the way out, he reportedly said that he would never again return for advice and he never returned for advice. And no president since then has ever gone to the Senate for advice in that way. So just a couple of months into Washington's presidency, one of these key elements of the constitution to provide support for the president, Washington has concluded just doesn't make sense because the senators act like senators and they're annoying and they move too slowly to provide the support of uh, the type of support and input that is required for diplomacy and foreign policy. So Washington turned to the second option, which is also in Article 2, and it says that the president may require the opinion in writing of the department secretaries on issues to pertaining to their respective duties. This clause was crafted very carefully. So first, the president may require. The president is not obligated to require, nor is the president obligated to follow the advice. Second, that advice is supposed to be in writing to ensure that there is a paper trail of evidence about who said what and who advocated which policy. And this is a direct response to the concerns about the British cabinet and the lack of transparency in that system. So initially Washington started right away by ex extending letters back and forth between the department secretaries and himself. But you know, today if we think about our communications We'll often send emails or text messages. Sometimes things get lost in translation or the tone isn't maybe conveyed as we want it to be. Maybe we forget to ask a question or we forget to you know, include an attachment to our email and all of a sudden we have an email chain that's a mile long. So imagine trying to deal with matters of state for the very first time, huge important precedent setting issues. And you're having to do it with parchment and quill. So you have to write out your letter in parchment you have to wait for it to dry so it doesn't smudge. You have to wait for it to be hand delivered by a clerk. Then you have to wait for the other person to write back in the same way. And then what happens if you have follow-up questions or something isn't clear? This is an incredibly inefficient system. And so Washington concluded that he really needed a little bit more speediness <laughs> and a little bit more flexibility in when he was having these conversations. So he started sending a letter to the department secretaries and then he would ask them to come meet with him one on one. So there still was a written record of what they were discussing, but they could kind of hash out any additional details in person. Uh, this is a 3D recreation of the president's house in Philadelphia, which is where Washington spent most of his presidency. Unfortunately, the house itself no longer exists. 
I don't know if you can see the little hand mouse guy, but this little brick dwelling, this is the second floor here. That was where Washington's private study was located. And it would have looked a little something like this. The room was 15 by 21 feet. It was absolutely stuffed with furniture. It would have felt claustrophobic by 21st century standards, very much like a hoarder's room. The uh, desk in the corner was over five feet wide and would have actually been pulled out a bit from the wall because there were writing surfaces on both sides, one for Washington and one for his private secretary to um, make copies of the letters he was writing, things like that. Washington had at least three mahogany bookcases, his dressing table, he had a mirror, he had a stove in the corner for heat in the winter, his globe, his uncommon chair. Many of these items actually still exist in the Mount Vernon collection. And then when the secretaries came to visit for these one-on-one -on -one consultations, he would usually have a one of his enslaved servants bring in a table and chairs for them to have a place to sit as well. So that process worked for two and a half years. Washington did not convene his first cabinet meeting until November 26, 1791, two and a half years into his presidency. And I'm stomping hard on that date and that amount of time because it demonstrates that Washington was not intending to create a cabinet from day one. He was not always planning to do this. This was not a preordained or destined sort of thing. Even though these guys were in office from the beginning, it did not mean they were meeting from the beginning. So just in case these people aren't familiar to you from left to right, we have President George Washington, Secretary of War Henry Knox, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. Now, when Washington gathered his cabinet, he gathered them in this space. So again, remember what I said about it being 15 by 21 feet, absolutely stuffed with furniture. In 1791, when they met, they met a couple of times, 1792 a couple of times, then in 1793, they met up to 51 times. Most of those meetings took place in the summer in Philadelphia, in this room, up to five times per week, sometimes several hours per day. And by that point, Hamilton and Jefferson despised each other. So you can imagine, without air conditioning, what that atmosphere would have felt like. It would have been toxic, and you could have cut the tension with a knife. So how did Washington manage this particularly um, uh, opinion-filled and personality-filled group? Well, he copied and pasted the practices that he had perfected in his councils of war directly into the executive branch. He sent out questions ahead of time. He used those questions as his agenda. If they disagreed, he asked for written opinions to study and make decisions and have its evidence. He invited them over for family dinners to try and build some esprit de corps, which didn't work quite as well in the presidency as it had during the war. And he also used the cabinet for the same purposes. He convened cabinet meetings for cover for political contro politically controversial decisions. He convened cabinet meetings to build consensus about difficult choices. And of course, he convened cabinet meetings to get advice when he didn't know what to do. So here's how that worked in time. In 1794, George Washington sent Chief Justice John Jay to London to negotiate a new treaty with Great Britain. And the Jay Treaty, which was sent back in 1795 and ratified, in, uh, ratified and then signed by Washington in August of 1795, was then sent to the House of Representatives. It was sent to the House because one of the clauses in the treaty required uh, the government to create a commission, and that commission was going to cost money, and so the House had to approve those funds. But the treaty was incredibly unpopular with the Jeffersonian Republicans, or the Democratic Republicans, or just the Republicans as they called themselves. It's a little bit, I tend to call them the Democratic Republicans to distinguish between the modern Republican Party, because it is not the same thing, but in case that language, if you see that in a book, that's what that means. The Democratic Republican Party really, really, really did not like this treaty, and they saw the, it going to the House as an opportunity to scuttle it. And so they decided to request all executive papers pertaining to the Jay Treaty because they felt that Washington and Jay had been determined to sort of sell out the interests of the South. And if they could prove it in these papers, it would really embarrass the administration and destroy the treaty. Washington convened his cabinet and they decided unanimously to assert executive privilege for the first time. And I'd be happy to talk about this letter a little bit more in particular because his assertion of executive privilege is 
probably my favorite letter he wrote as president and is so spectacularly snarky, which Washington is not usually in his correspondence with Congress. But for the purpose of this moment, he convened the cabinet to make sure they agreed because it was a huge step to assert executive privilege for the first time. And he wanted to make sure that first they agreed that it was the right thing to do, but also to provide political cover for that choice. In 1793, Washington was faced with his first real diplomatic crisis. Uh, France had declared war on Great Britain and the conflict sp quickly spiraled to really encompass the entire globe and the United States was desperately trying to stay out of it. It was just beginning to recover financially, environmentally, emotionally, physically from the revolution and so really had no business getting into the war. And even if it had wanted to, we didn't have an army or navy. So it quite literally had nothing with which to fight. However, proclaiming neutrality, which is what Washington did in his proclamation there on the left is much more complicated in practice than just making the statement. How do you keep your citizens from entering into the war? If they do, what law are they breaking? Who is going to impose any sort of punishment? Which court is supposed to hear the case? Is it a jury case? Is it a judge case? These are just a couple of the questions that came up that the administration had to deal with. And those are only the domestic considerations. The foreign policy um, complications were even more insane because of the man at the center of your screen, citizen Edmund Charles Chenet. He was the new French minister to the United States and he had his own ideas about what the United States should be doing at any given moment. He thought that the US should come into the war on the side of France and give France a bunch of money and a bunch of supplies and, and participate in its defense. And when Jefferson explained that no, they actually could not do that and they were neutral, he kind of disregarded all of their orders. And he set up what was basically a privateer manufacturing shop in the court of, in the port of Philadelphia. Now, privateers, just a picture of that, no. Privateers were basically private ships that were sailing under a license or it was called a letter of mark from one of the warring nations. So for example, France would hire American citizens to sail private ships to go attack British ships. If they were successful and they captured that British ship, they would drag it back into port, sell off anything valuable, and then create a new privateer out of that captured ship. It was common war practice. Everyone did it in the 18th and 19th century, so that wasn't so much problem, except that Genet insisted upon doing it in the port of Philadelphia, which made American claims of neutrality a little bit suspicious, especially because the port of Philadelphia was six blocks from the president's house. So the star here on the right is where the port was. The star here on the left is where the president's house was. Needless to say, these activities did not go unnoticed by Washington, nor did they go unnoticed by the British minister who also happened to be residing in Philadelphia. So over the summer of 1793, the cabinet met up to 51 times to try and figure out how to resolve this issue. They ultimately decided to request the recall of Genet from France, which was a huge moment because the United States had never done that before. And when France agreed to it, it was a tacit acknowledgement that the United States had the right as a sovereign nation to set its own policy and expect that it be respected. And then the cabinet also created a list of eight rules of neutrality that basically governed neutral behavior, which Congress then codified into law. And that law served as neutral law up through the Civil War. So the cabinet was really essential in forming a consensus about what the administration should do when faced with a really complicated situation. And finally, in 1794, Washington was faced with the first domestic rebellion. In 1791, Congress had passed a tax on whiskey distilleries. These were sort of private distilleries at home that farmers would turn their excess grain or corn into alcohol, they could either use it or sell it or use it to barter in places in like Western Pennsylvania, Western Kentucky, Western Virginia, where getting things to Atlantic ports like Philadelphia, Baltimore were really difficult and expensive. Needless to say, this tax in those locations was incredibly unpopular and protests which had initially been peaceful turned violent in the summer of 1794 when rebels led by a former uh, Revolutionary War veteran burned down the home of a tax collector. 
Washington convened his cabinet and basically said, what do I do with this situation? This is brand new. And while Americans had a long history of protesting, he had never been in government. There had never been this federal government while this had happened. So the cabinet basically said, you have four options. You can leave it to the states to handle. It is technically a state, it could be interpreted as a state matter. You could wait for Congress to come back in session in the fall, because Congress was always out of session when anything interesting happened. You could convene an emergency session of Congress to call up the military and, and crush the rebellion. Or you could use a recently passed bill that says that in the event of a international invasion or a domestic rebellion and Congress is out of session, the president can put forth evidence of this rebellion in front of a Supreme Court justice. And if the Supreme Court justice approves, then the president can call up local militia to address the situation. And the cabinet advised that Washington use that last option and then attempt while calling up the militia to send a diplomatic uh, commission to try and come up with a peaceful solution, which is exactly what Washington did. When it was clear that the peaceful solution would not work. He called up the militias from Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and Maryland. They marched west. The rebellion quickly crumbled, and um, the people who were eventually convicted, which were actually relatively few, Washington did actually grant pardons for. However, the cabinet was essential in providing advice about how Washington should manage this situation. Towards the end of Washington's presidency, once that initial cabinet started to resign and retire, he filled those positions with what I affectionately call the B team. Uh, it was very hard to get people to, to take these positions. They weren't well paid. The conditions were difficult for travel. So you had to be away from home for a really long time. Uh, your reputation risked taking a hit if people criticized what you did while in office. So he really couldn't get his preferred people. And in fact, he had to ask six different candidates before finally settling on Timothy Pickering as his next secretary of state, which Pickering knew. So but not a great way to start a relationship. Um, but because he had this B team, he really decided that he was not going to meet with them as much. And he only convened a handful of meetings in his final years. And that left a really critical precedent that the cabinet is designed to help the president however the president thinks it will be most helpful. That could mean that the president could meet once a week or twice a week like Lincoln and Roosevelt did. The president can meet sometimes with a few different secretaries or secretaries one at a time like Franklin D. Roosevelt did. The president can prefer to meet with White House staff or people in Congress or people from former uh, lines of work like JFK did, or the president can speak with friends and family if they are his preferred advisors. Whatever option the president decides, those relationships are almost entirely outside of the oversight of Congress and the American people, which can produce really great things with that flexibility sometimes if presidents can manage it really well, but could also be a huge detriment if a president is not a good manager and is sort of befuddled by this flexibility. So I would argue because of that, Washington's cabinet is perhaps one of his most influential and underappreciated precedents and the one of the ones that continues to stick with us most today. I'd like to close with a little story about how history has a sense of humor and uh, a sense of fate and it ties in perfectly for our theme tonight. Um, I am still indeed giving uh, book plates to those who buy the book. So if you don't already have a copy, please pick one up from your favorite bookstore or from the Lafayette uh, Alliance, that would be great. And then um, I'm putting in to the chat here, the link, you can just type in your information and I will send you a personalized book plate. I designed them myself with the hound on it for a couple of reasons. So first, George Washington loved dogs. He just loved them. And he had dogs of every single breed and gave them hilarious names like Sweet Lips, which I think is so funny. However, his favorite were the American Foxhound. And this was a breed that he actually created himself. He had a bunch of English hounds, which didn't do very well in the Virginia summer. And so he bred them with French hounds that he received as a gift from none other than the Marquis de Lafayette. I didn't know this when I adopted my dog. His name is John Quincy Dog Adams, Quincy for short. And I did one of those DNA tests and it turns out 
that he is a full bred, he was rescue. He is a full bred American foxhound. So sense of fate, I ended up having George Washington's breed without knowing it, but the story gets better. When I started doing this virtual book tour, someone said to me, Lindsay, do you know how the hounds got from France to Mount Vernon? I said, well, I know that they were a gift from Lafayette. And they said, yeah, but do you know how they got there? Well, it turns out that the person who brought them from Lafayette to Mount Vernon was John Quincy Adams, which I also didn't know when I picked the name John Quincy Dog Adams for my dog. So history has a sense of humor. History has a sense of fate. Because of those things, I have a little dog on my book plate. Um, in homage to both Washington and my love of hounds. So I will stop there. I would now love to take your questions on the cabinet, councils of war, hounds, whatever you prefer. Let me try that again. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Stravinsky. Uh, we, we have been uh, honored to have you tonight. And we do have a few questions. Um, I did not realize... I, I guess I've seen on your social media in passing and in, in my scrolling that I knew you had the hound, but I didn't realize it was the Lafayette hound. We posted about that on social media of, about Lafayette's connection with the hound and stuff coming over. Oh, fantastic. So I didn't know, but that's, that's perfect. Maybe next time we'll do it, we'll post your picture on there too with it. And, <laughs> well, uh, and I actually have a picture of Quincy in a tricorn hat at Mount Vernon. So um, we'll have that, to get, that's we'll like have to the permission perfect. to post that then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so we do have a few questions for you. And um, if those of us, uh, those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat section and I will help Dr. Chavinsky, although she probably doesn't need any, to kind of parse through the questions. Um, but I do, I, I want to, to take the, the privilege of the first two questions here. One, with your upcoming book on Adams, um, you know, of course, Adams and Lafayette, it, from Father Adams to, to Son Adams uh, to, to Lafayette uh, in, 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 in Quincy, uh, there were plenty of, of uh, encounters with Lafayette. Uh, are we going to see some, you know, we won't ask for a full chapter in the book, but are we going to see some <laughs> Lafayette uh, throughout your next book? Um, I would suspect that he would at least make an appearance. So mm -hmm. I, am, I am about a third of the way through the book. Um, and I am just getting to the point now where John Quincy Adams is in Berlin and he's sort of reporting back on what is happening. So I suspect that there will be some, some mentioning here and there of various things. Wonderful. Well, both myself and Dr. Ingham, who's currently messaging me here, uh, we, want, we want to know more about the assertion of executive privilege. And I did write that down to ask uh, with a Dre treaty in the letter. Uh, if you can expand on that and, and feel free to kind of tell us uh, why it's your favorite or why you enjoy it. Yes. So this is such a spectacular moment. So um, as I mentioned, the, this treaty was very unpopular with certain segments of the population. There was a sense that Jay had sold out Southern interests. And I think this is really unfair. I personally think that Jay got the very best deal that could have been had because the United States had zero leverage in these negotiations. Zero. The only thing that Britain wanted basically from them was to like not go to war, but that's not particularly good leverage. So the fact that Jay got any concessions at all was remarkable. That being said, uh, Jay also didn't particularly care about the interests of the slave owning South. So maybe he did prioritize them a little bit less than the Northerners. I will acknowledge that that is probably true. So what happens in March of 1796 is the House decides to ask for these papers. Washington in the past had been very clear that he was delighted um, to provide materials. He was delighted to hand over any sort of paperwork and had indeed complied in the past with Congress's requests. So he had established a principle that Congress had the right to oversee the executive. And so he starts off his letter by reminding them that this was a principle that he adhered to. He thought it was really important that Congress had oversight powers over the executive. However, Diplomacy, which is what these papers require or are pertaining to, requires an additional level of secrecy because foreign nations need to trust that their conversations with American representatives will remain private because no one wants to see how the sausage gets made of diplomacy and it needs to remain secret, it needs to remain private, what we would sort of deem national security interests today. He didn't use that language, but that's sort of what he's saying. So he says this is a, a more important consideration. And he says, however, 
if this were an impeachment inquiry, that would be a different story. And I would have to meet a higher burden to prove secrecy. So he's saying basically that an impeachment inquiry is a more important inquiry than just a standard congressional inquiry and has a much higher level for the president to get out of complying with that than just a normal investigation. He's also kind of daring the House to impeach him, which he knows they're not going to do. So it's, you know, it's a pretty gutsy move, but he also kind of knows the outcome. Then Washington says, I was at the Constitutional Convention. I was there when we were discussing who had the right to make treaties, who had the right to be a part of this process. You are trying to usurp authority that is not granted to you by the Constitution. You are not supposed to play a role in the treaty making process. And if you do not agree with me, I have the journals from the convention sitting in the Department of State offices and you are welcome to come take a look at them. It is the ultimate sort of mic drop gauntlet throwing <laughs> moment. And it's very sassy for him. He's not usually that sassy. Needless to say, in the face of this opposition, sort of the House opposition crumbled and uh, he very much carried the day. That's interesting. It's almost like it's almost as if he's saying, you know, like don't don't play originalism with me, like the interpretation of the Constitution. Yes, I was yes. there. Yeah, you know, we wrote it. Very interesting. Um, so we we have Doctor Hall, or sorry, uh, Alan Hoffman of the president of the law, of the American Friends of, of Lafayette, chiming in here. He said, "Wonderful lecture," um, and that one of the members of the AFL has said that John Quincy Adams abandoned the hounds in New York in his haste to get to Harvard College, and oh. Washington was not happy. Okay, so I haven't. I will admit, I haven't dug into this element of the story all that much, but now I'm going to be prompted to do so. And as we know. John Quincy Adams leaves very extensive records, so I will I will get to the bottom of it and report back. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, may, well, maybe I can pitch both for the AFL and the Lafayette Alliance. We'd both love to, you know, have you write something for our newsletters. I know the Gazette for the AFL and and the Cockade for for the Lafayette Alliance. Just plug in that. You've got my. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Gail says, uh, you, you gave a, an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Could you give us your email address? Sure. My email address is available on my website, but I will also put it into the chat. It's just doctor, my first name, my last name at gmail.com, but my last name is a little bit difficult to spell. So that's why I put it there. <laughs> After all of the advertisements I had to do for Lafayette Alliance, I know how to spell it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. No, no worries. So are there any other questions before we wrap up here tonight? Once again, Dr. Travinsky, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. We've, we've been honored to have you. And thank you for taking time out of your Friday uh, to be with us. And uh, maybe we can have you back again when the, the Adams book comes out. And then we'll, uh, we'll wait on the Lafayette, uh, the Lafayette portions. <laughs> Yes, that would be delightful. Thank you all so much for attending and sharing your Friday night with me. I look forward to talking with you about the Adams family when the time comes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending.